I'll let you get to go. Okay. I have been developing Fox software since 1987 um, with Fox Base 2.1 and multi user Fox Base 2.1. And my development experience has spanned since then. My interests originally were more low level stuff than just database software. So I have a lot of C background experience and assembly. But what I'm showing today is a project I've written recently called Color Wheel and another one called Real Time. And I wrote these to demonstrate some features that allow us to augment Visual Fox Pro by using tools that are integrated with Visual Fox Pro through an API so that some of the work that can't easily be done in Visual Fox Pro, like drawing graphics, can be done in this other DLL. And then through the API, it kind of exposes that drawing functionality in an easy to program way. So what I've got here is um, a slide outline to kind of go through. And my goals primarily are to demonstrate the Visual Fox Pro side of it, and work together. Did we just lose Rick there, or did we just go quiet? Yeah, I'm not hearing Rick. I don't hear him either, so something happened. See if he comes back. Hey, Marco. Hi. Hi. We had uh, just gotten started, but then we lost Rick, our presenter. So we're waiting for him to come back. Where'd you lose me at? Uh, you gave your introduction, and then that you look like you were starting to go to the slide. There is when we lost you. Okay. Um, <laughs> oh, sorry about that. Um, I had a message pop up when I brought up the chat window, and it said reconnected. So I didn't know what happened there. Maybe that's when I lost you. Um, what I would like to demonstrate here is there's color wheel and real time. Both of these have seven questions, which are more or less identical. What, I'm, what I'll be going through is describing what is Color Wheel, what does it offer, and same thing for real time. Um, can it do more than what is currently shown in these examples? How do I use it in Visual Fox Pro? How is it that it draws so fast? What is C++ and do I need to know C++ to use this? And then also, um, time permitting, we'll go over some of the actual classes themselves and some information about the C++ side of it. So the first thing here is, this is what Color Wheel and Real Time are. Color Wheel was a project that I created to simply draw this little color box and uh, allow a few um, controls here along the outside. It has some abilities to extract the color from where you are. And I'll actually run this in full screen so you can see it. Um, some of the colors on this particular one. As you adjust these up and down, you can see that the colors change. As you rotate around, the colors cycle. Um, but what this does is this presents a box. And if you go up here someplace in it and click on it, it highlights the color of where you've clicked. Now, this doesn't seem like a big deal, but what's happening is 
in terms of programming is this rectangle where this is being drawn is not being drawn by Fox Pro. This is not a Fox Pro control per se. There's a placeholder which says how big it should be, which is this rectangle right here, but this layer is not being drawn. This content is actually part of the startup method. It actually creates a connection to this other DLL and it gives it these coordinates for where the left top width and height are and then the DLL itself, the color wheel DLL, which is something else written outside of Fox Pro, does all of the drawing, handles all of the mouse moves, and does everything in and of itself. You saw, I don't know if you could see it for a minute there, it was all black, just for a fraction of a second. Hey, Rich, the only thing we seem to be seeing is the, looks like a PDF. You don't see this color chart on top? Um... I see what looks like your splash screen with the color wheel on the left side and then the two gauges on the right side. Okay. I do see all of your desktop and your Windows menu on the left side. Everything right now you do? There's something kind of Let's blinking see. on the screen as well. <laughs> okay. And you're not able to see the content inside of this window. I don't see anything changing or anything. We can see your mouse moving. That's interesting. I wonder if it's because I have this on. It uh, worked just fine when we did it this afternoon, right? Yeah, it did. Yeah, I'm not sure what's happening right now. It's flashing wildly. Can I, can I be heard right now? Yes. Yes. When I spoke last month, we, there was an issue where I ended up, every time I changed context, I had to click something, which I think is that little tiny orange tab at the top of the screen, and then click the window that I had given focus to. Okay. Okay. Can you see it now? Can you see it now? Yep. There was something really weird just happening because my whole screen where this rectangle is was just flashing inverted and then back, you know, like negative, positive, negative, positive colors. It was freaking me out for a minute. Okay. So you can see it now. <laughs> yeah. Now we're seeing the big box with the colors. Okay. Let me go back a little bit then. I'm not sure where. Our... This is the actual um, color right here. Um, this is the control. All of this rectangle that I'm, can you see my mouse moving over the rectangle now? Is not drawn by Visual Fox Pro. It's drawn by the DLL on top of the Visual Fox Pro form. So everything here is a form and there's a placeholder underneath this in design mode, which is holding the rectangle shape for that to be. But the content is actually um, drawn externally, which is what the purpose of why I wanted to show you color wheel. It allows you to have mouse interaction and like I can click on a location here and wherever I click and drag and hold down it updates the color in this little box over here from where I'm doing this. But none of this interaction is taking place inside of Fox Pro. All of this is taking place through a window that the DLL is responding to and then it's communicating with Fox Pro to say what color was at the location where the user clicked and so forth. Does that all make sense so far? Yeah, that makes sense to me so far. Everybody else's okay. mic is on, so if you guys want to, there's only six of us tonight. If you want to jump in and say anything, go ahead, I think. Excellent. Excellent. I will go to design mode and um, put this up here. This rectangle right here is the placeholder. And what the form does is on the init event, it just simply tells it where that is on the screen. So on this form's handle that Windows uses, which is HWIND, handle to a window, this HWIND value, it creates its own window with these coordinates over the top of it. So when this goes to redraw something by moving one of these controls, these controls do some 
operation here on the on change event, which is update the color info. So if we go to the function that does that, the method, update color info, it will resend the values of what those controls are indicating, the red setting, the green setting, the blue setting, and so forth. And then it will go ahead and automatically redraw once those get changed. So what's happening is all of these controls are sending the DLL in the background some information. Each time that information changes, it redraws this rectangle. But none of this is happening from inside FoxPro. The only thing that's happening inside FoxPro is this one function call passing all of these values to the DLL. And this is how it ends up being able to draw so quickly because it's drawn outside of Visual Fox Pro. Um, I can increase this, and I'm not sure how fast you can see it on, you know, over a shared thing like this, but these colors rotate and it draws exceedingly rapidly. Something just happened there. And as I draw these colors, um, this communication is taking place, which is part of what I want to show you here. We'll go back to my presentation. The color wheel draws this particular control. It was the first one I wrote, and it's fairly primitive compared to what real time is. Real time draws these other controls, which I'll go ahead and demonstrate very quickly, but I'll come back to those here in just a little bit. The, this is a basic screen, um, and then I have the controls over here that I can enable by clicking the show button. And I'm not sure what you'll be able to see on this either, if it's being able to be drawn fast enough. But this one over here is designed to scale, if you have this checked or not. And the needle itself will move to certain positions or actually move, you know, like it's snapping to certain integer values or it's actually drawing itself at the real values. And these are the, the controls that are drawn on top of the form over here. So you've got, you have two different gauges with different styles, and then there's this graph. Um, I can pause these here to show you more stuff about them. But this graph is just a rectangle. This gauge here is a rectangle. And this right here is a rectangle so far as Visual Fox Pro knows. So if we, I'm running this on a virtual machine. we look at the form, all we will see up there are those rectangles. And in the same kind of way, there's the show button which initializes these controls. It basically takes this form, which is a Visual Fox Pro form, and it will create windows over these rectangle coordinates. And then inside of those windows, it's able to draw all of its content. It draws the gauge and it draws the graph. color wheel draws a color picker. Real time currently only draws a graph and a gauge, but th these can be extended. They're very similar in how they're designed, but color wheel was done first and it was only designed as like a one shot. I just kind of did it as a proof of concept and I didn't allow a lot of being able to expand it. So when I went back, I took the basic framework of what I had written with color wheel and I rewrote it in real time and real time now can be extended significantly. Um, both draw graphics objects very rapidly and do so apart from Visual Fox Pro. And they both have unique merit. Because Color Wheel was drawn first or done first, it's very simple. It doesn't have a lot of complexity to be able to handle multiple objects and stuff like that. So when you look at the code, it's pretty straightforward. When you go into real time, it's a little bit more convoluted because it's doing a lot more. But more or less, they're the same. Um, they just simply handle things a little bit differently internally. Color Wheel is only capable of doing one window at a time for the entire application. You can't have two or three color pickers up at the same time on the screen. You can only have one. But real time lets you have multiple forms up simultaneously. Each one of them can have multiple graphs or gauges simultaneously. So these two are, you know, it's like a generation beyond what the original Color Wheel was. In order to carry out their both of them create the H, their own H wins on top of the Pro's H wind. So that's what each one of those placeholders is for, is where that will go. And that window is just 
it's basically just like this window we have right here. I can resize this and so forth. This is an actual window that exists. And then you create another window that does not have a border on top of the Visual Fox Pro. Onto that window, I'm able to do something. I think it drawn as Visual Fox Pro objects, even though they're on the form. But what Windows does is Windows will physically send out commands to repaint the content on that con that control, and then that's where the color wheel DLL or the real time DLL step in action. All that for Visual or in place of Visual Fox Pro, which is why it gets done so quickly. This exposes the Visual Fox Pro app to easy multi-threading because Windows know, knows how to send out commands and different threads to draw different windows at the same time. Visual Fox Pro is still processing its normal program execution, timer events, whatever it's already doing, but they need to be redrawn. If you happen to take something and um, move it off the bottom of the screen for previously hidden off the bottom of the screen is now told by Windows, or Windows tells the application, please redraw this rectangle that's now visible that was just a second ago not drawn. So it knows how to do things like that, and it will do those separately from Visual Fox Pro. There's a very interesting thing I put on here about Windows being like the man behind the curtain in The Wizard of Oz. When we do Visual Fox Pro programming, we're more or less told to never worry about what happens in Windows. We have our Visual Fox Pro framework, we have our form designer, report designer, everything. We write code for those things. But by doing a small amount of extra work, um, through the, like this DLL, for example, all of the capabilities that exist in Windows itself are now exposed to us. And by putting those inside of this DLL and creating a, a class which goes along with it, um, it allows us to have a very simple interface to expose some of these complex low-level Windows features, but through an API which is usable by an application or usable by people in general. So there's good features and there's bad features about that, about paying no attention to the man behind the curtain, which is actually Windows. Our applications work very well within Visual Fox Pro, but it's also kind of bad because we don't have a lot of these other features exposed to us. And in this particular case, with the This allows us to have something that Visual Fox Pro has always kind of been weak on, which is just the ability to add, easily add graphics on top of forms. Um, this is probably one of the only times you'll hear me say this, by the way. When we uh, lost, lost you there again, Rick. Okay. You said the only time we're going to hear you say this and then it cut out and we didn't hear it. Okay, are you there? Yep. Or am I there? Mm -hmm. Are you able to still see my mouse moving and stuff? Yep. Okay. This is one of the times you'll hear me say this. We must remember that Windows is pretty amazing at its core. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm not a big Windows fan, but Windows, and I'm talking about Win32 here, which is something that goes back to like Windows 95, the original. Over the course of time, it's been very um... Yeah, we lost you again. You've been cutting out just a little bit the whole time, but it seems like we're getting bigger drops now for some reason. And see your slide, but we don't hear you.
Can you hear Rick? Nope, I'm not hearing anything from him. Looks like maybe he's going to show instead of tell. I don't think he realizes we can't hear him. So he loses it and can't hear us either, huh? Yeah, that's what I was thinking. He might want to go to the phone option. Might work better. Well, I'm using it. Let's see, does that work? It's supposed to be a no. <laughs> you all saw that drawing, didn't you? I can see his screen. Did you see me drawing on the screen? No, I can only see his uh, moving the cursor. Let's see, how do we stop him? <laughs> uh, Maybe try making yourself the presenter again, and then he would get a notification he was no longer the presenter. There we go. Let's try that. Is that you, Rick? Yeah, I'm here. I don't know what's happening. We lost you. Um, you want to try the phone connection instead of the voice over IP? I can. Did you actually lose the video connection too? Because it said presenter is now Todd. Uh, yeah, we lost you when I did that, but we lost you about okay. two minutes before that when you started, when you went to your code, we lost you. I'm sorry. Well. What was the last thing you heard? Uh, you were on your slide with the six things about the DLLs. That was where we lost it. Okay. okay. Well, we can definitely hear you that way. So I'll make you the presenter again. Okay. Up there. Uh, we're seeing your beginning slide there is what we're seeing. Uh, looks like you're sharing just that window instead of the desktop. Yes. Okay. Here are the six things that are up there right now. Yep. 
We can see that just fine. Okay. Um, I'm not sure what I said before, so I'll say it again. The DLLs add extend functionality. They provide raw access to that Win32 functionality, which exists at the core of Windows. Um, the DLLs can be thought of as black boxes because once you set them up, they just simply exist and run the way they do. We have a lot of DLLs we use right now in existing programming, like the user32.dll or GDI, um, the kernel32. We will declare our DLL functions in those, and then we just simply use the functions which exist um, to, for our program to do whatever it needs to do. The new DLL functions that we create ourselves, for example, in color wheel and real time, they um, are just simply extensions of what exists in Visual Box Pro. And the DLLs, because they're written in C and C++, are generally very fast. They execute um, code very quickly. They're not interpreted. They are simply compiled and run on the CPU itself. Can you see the next slide? We have... Um, yeah, we can see that, okay. VCX and the DLL. Okay. The color wheel VCX and color wheel DLL. Um, the color wheel VCX doesn't do a lot in this function or in this um, application. I just missed all this. Let's see. It's hard to do it from hand now. If we look at the color wheel class itself, it doesn't do anything specific. We have the radio dial, which is a control that exists on the form. But in terms of actually drawing, we have a declare DLL function here, or some code which just simply declares each one of the functions that exist in the DLL, along with the parameters that are passed. And then we have on the form itself, um, it just on the init code, it makes the connection. And then each time one of these controls is changed, it calls the on change event, which then updates the color info, which then redraws the control. So this is all kind of integrated with the form. It's not something that exists separately or as a real requisite, like this class is not necessarily required. However, with real time, that's not the case. Real time is required. It has the gauge, graph, and the real time DLL definition code, which um, declares all the DLL functions as well. But it now exists not as a PRG, but as an actual class that's dropped onto a form or some parent object. These each have a, their own set of properties and their own methods. And these are somewhat more substantial. But once these are created, it's more or less also just like a black box. You simply drop the control onto a form, and it works. There are a few settings on this form that are unique for this one application. But for the most part, this is the rectangle. You click the show button, it calls the init event, and then it just starts drawing by itself. So for real time, the real time class and the DLL are required. This color wheel VCX and color wheel DLL, the VCX is required in this one example, but it's not really required. Um, when dropping the controls on a form, you push them to the back so they're initialized first. Um, this has to do with the order of the init events. I've seen this before in um, Stonefield, I think, has that requirement when you bring up certain forms, you drop objects on them and push them to the back. This allows them to be initialized so that things that rely upon those are seen all of the code, all of the DLLs already declared and so forth.
the way that these draw is to a background memory buffer. The color wheel itself draws two actual directions. It draws one horizontally and one vertically. And then it adds them together, which is what produces the content and the color. That's controlled by the rotation on the control. And then the graph and the gauge are just simply drawn based on what they look like. Bars going horizontally or vertically down. The content on the left, which is the graduation, the main center line, the actual data points, and so forth. And the gauge is drawn in three parts. Um, it's got a low, mid, and high color. There's something else that's used here, which is an alpha channel. Um, in Visual Fox Pro, we're not very familiar with that. The alpha channel allows transparency and semi-opaque um, controls to be drawn on top of other ones. Um, I'm going to skip past this for the most part. Um, about what C and C++ are. But it's in here if somebody would like to read about it. Do I need to know C or C++ in order to use these? Um, that's one of the beauties about this kind of design. Once you create the DOL and once the classes are created, they become those black boxes where you just simply drop them on there. You use the um, properties that are on the individual class, some of the methods that allow you to assign um, while it's actually running and being redrawn. And apart from that, it just simply works. It does itself in the, or draws itself in the background. So you can... Uh, basically, basically, you say that uh, we could use the, the, this kind of DLS to, to get data into Fox Pro applications in, in some other thread, but not to interact with that data. That data. What do you mean by that data? When you uh, draw the, uh, a graph with the DLL, uh, where is that data coming from? OK, I'm going to put a little bit of one up here on the screen by drawing this kind of quickly. Um, then I'll slow it down. I'll actually pause it up here. This graph exists as a series of points in memory. They have been fed by this particular form by one method. Um, I'll show you on the screen. On the class itself for the graph, there's a method that says add data point. You pass it a value, and then the code here sends it there and says, Here's the new value, and it will automatically so redraw. So we pass the, the data in real time from BSP to the DLL. Exactly. Right. So so we can implement a, a I don't know. Could you give us an example to use this on, on in a database? The particular individual that I wrote this for, that is a manufacturing facility. And it's an assembly line where these things are filled. And they go over a scale. And the scale is moving at the rate of about 200 objects per minute. So this thing has to do samples of how much does this weigh. And what ended up happening. I, uh, I remember you, you gave advice to someone in site uh, who, who was asking how to collect data from the uh, serial port. Uh, it was you. Um, I don't know if that was me, <laughs> but I, I do know how to do that. <laughs> um, this particular one, so, I added the so, noise on here. Go ahead. This could be used to to graph uh, that data for from from readers, uh, or high speed readers, or, or to to show. Um, yeah, uh, graph of, of um, highly uh, high speed produced data on real time. Exactly. The purpose of the average function that I added on there 
was because the data he was getting on these samples, because it was reading three or four or five times a second, um, there was a little bit of noise in them. You know, it's the conveyor going up and down and the content shuffling as it's moving along. So it was producing this wide range of um, data points on the graph. So he asked me to have some way to smooth it. I told him at first <laughs> he could pre process the data and send it in smooth, but he wanted me to put it down the graph. So I added the average abilities. Um, that's also where the range came about, that yellow section in the middle. is shows what the highs and lows are for the surrounding specified number, I think it's 64 um, samples. And what that does is that shows the noise in addition to the actual graphs themselves. Um, let me turn off that one control that's making the range go up and down. I love Visual Fox for some time. <laughs> uh, let's see. I think this is it. That's the data point generator. Do this with one hand. This is hard to do. Okay. Build. Okay, this will stay now without constantly going up and down. I guess it's not doing the actual drawing. Now what this originally was was just a sine wave. But because he was having the noise in the data points, he asked me to add this other stuff. So this is presenting the sine wave with noise in it. So when I add the randomness on there, it shows a much smoother line. But the range there still shows nearby what the high and low points are to its sign. So this allowed him at a glance to look and see what the baseline is along with how wildly this thing is filling the parts and so forth. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Yeah. There are other options on the class which allow you to change things like um, make this one without the scale on here. You can change the number of decimals you have here. You can change the number of decimals you have out here. And the purpose of the scale was because he was using these really high resolution numbers for very small ranges. And he needed to be able to draw it someplace else. So I gave him this sine wave going back and forth with the scale so he could figure out you know, how it does it mechanically. Then he added it on the form the way he needed it. Um, some of the abilities that this is drawn, you see where the needle is. It highlights the color of this highlight box in the middle along with the needle itself. And this other part I call a framing around the gauge. Um, you can manually introduce points by dragging on here and going up and down. Let's just go a little faster. And then what these points will do is you can see the range there gets much higher. That's the noise that exists in the points. But if we were to average these out, you see that's more or less what the line there actually is. And the more you average it out, the closer it gets. So this is one example of this drawing capability. For a practical application, you use that one method. You send it the data points. There are, let me get to the actual class definition here on this page. Color wheel is very simple. Um, it has just these few methods. It has this small DLL interface. Um, I show the sample of the Visual Fox Pro Designer along with the C++ code, along with a little bit of the program. But these all correlate to each other. Um, the color wheel is really exceedingly primitive compared to what real time is. If we go to 
the real-time definition, you see it has all of these different methods and properties for each one of those that have changed. We'll look at some of the graph, um, some of the properties that relate to the graph. There's the two-color form. I'll have this running in the background to do this. We have the bar one and bar two, which are just the alternating colors, which exist here. We have the grid center, and there's a color for that, color for the lines, um, color for the range. Like the grid here is all white, but the center line is a yellow. It's kind of hard to see because I've made this yellow also. But you can put a line on here anywhere you want to just by setting a value. And then there's the lower right, lower left, upper left, upper right, just the four corners of the rectangle for coloring because the particular thing he was using used this gradient color like this where the color starts out at a darker color in the upper left and goes to a lighter color in the lower right. If you do it in a single color, it ends up looking like this average weight area where it kind of stands out and it's not quite proper. But I actually, in these controls, I draw the background, I draw the control itself on there, I draw the text on it, every um, as it goes along. There are some of the properties that convey how the graph itself actually looks. Um, are you still there? Yep, we're still here. We got you. I'm here. Okay. Tomorrow just I said good night is all. That, so I guess I'm disconnected again that way. Take that off anyway. Okay. The real-time graph has properties for how thick the lines are. And that shows these data points right here, how big they are drawn. And I really did design this for him. More or less makes straight lines like that. What else? There are certain things you can turn on and off, like this has a grid visible quality, and whether or not the range is visible. Um, there's just different features on here that you can set up. And these are all live. So if you change these at any time during the course of the graph itself being redrawn, it will redraw it with or without those features. And that's one of the advantages of having this as a DLL also, because it just simply runs and goes. These are the methods that exist that are exposed to outwardly. And while it does all the drawing itself on the inside of the DLL, this is all you have to worry about inside your Foxglow application. You initialize it. You have the hide and show features, which I can go over here and hide and show these controls by clicking these buttons. And they still operate in the background. They're just not physically rendered onto the screen. You have a lower range and upper range, which is the bottom of your scale and your upper scale. You have the ability to add a new data point. Each time you add a new data point, it takes all the existing data points and shifts them over to the left by one slot. You can set a sample average count, which I think by default is some high number, um, 16 or 32, I can't remember, some number. And what this does is it makes your line smoother. You can clear all the graph samples if they, they are resets to having no data. Or you can scale them up and down. And what scaling then does is it allows you to move from one, um, like pounds to kilograms, or miles per hour to kilometers per hour, whatever it is you're sampling. And you can change all of your data samples in one command by this by just simply saying, here's a new scale. It adjusts all of your data point values, and then you simply give it a new high and a low in the new scale, and the graph has now switched from pounds to kilograms, for example. Hmm. And there is the math refresh function, which redraws the graph whenever you call it. Gauge does things more or less the same way. It has features designed specifically for gauge. 
um, for a gauge, like whether or not the needle should be colorized. Right now you see this it has a red hue to it with a black tip. If you turn that off, it makes it all black. Just a very simple thing. Right now you can see that this, there's this circle around the outside of the gauge itself, which is red. If you turn that off, it just simply draws in the three colors you have specified. It doesn't highlight the content. Hmm. Um, to kind of give you a visual cue is what you want. So you can see at a glance, it's clearly red, clearly yellow, clearly white. Um, the graduation decimals, I demonstrated that a second ago, where you can do the minus, minus, and plus, plus, and so forth. And this will let you change how precise things are drawn in the control for graduation. And the scale factor on this one is how big the graph should be drawn. The scale factor here is going up and down from 1.0 to 0.25, I think, or point something, I remember, 0.25. And what it does is it just basically renders the graph in this way, based on what the size is. These are the functions to get from Visual Script View to make this happen. There is the init function you call it startup. You can hide or show it on the form or in the parent container, whatever it's in. Um, then you have your range start and range end. That should say range end. That's the zero and the 200 right here. Start to zero and goes to 200. And then the needle value you set is anything you want to. If it happens to fall within this range, it'll be drawn where it's supposed to go. If you set it to minus 1,000, it'll just draw at zero. If you set it to plus 1,000, it'll just draw at 200. And then the refresh, refresh function causes it to redraw. You'll notice also in this, these controls, there's a little bit of shading, which is kind of like a little bit grayer or darker color here in the middle than it is out toward the end. What I did for that was I took this shape right here and just more like wrapped it around the control after I um, draw it on the screen the first time. And it gives just a little bit of shade. Cool. Uh, that's why, uh, Rick. Yes. I think I, I have uh, one use for for this kind of of libraries. Uh, I've been thinking of, of of showing the internet traffic in my uh, in Interfox server that you you see later. Um, Let me. Um bring this back up here on the project. Right now, these are the classes which exist. There's the gauge and the graph. And they do the things they're designed to do right now. And I'll bring up the C++ code here just real quickly to show you some of the interface. These are the functions which exist, if you can see this. Um, we have these graph functions which are exposed, and we have these gauge functions which are exposed. But if somebody else wanted to draw a, you know, a pyramid function, then what you would do is you would go over here and you would add the functions for a pyramid and so forth. So the idea is that real time, because of the way it's designed, allows you to add in other components, other controls very easily. Um, the heavy lifting of doing the mechanics of creating the windows and redrawing them and all that stuff already exists. All you have to do now is create the interface to be able to receive the unique set of data or points or design schematics, whatever it is you want to draw, whatever that drawing particularly needs for the thing you want to draw. And then you have a little bit of code which actually does the rendering. Um, for someone like um, Caesar, who is a very experienced with the GDI, on a GDI++ plus plus, or plus, he would be able to recognize the mechanics of what's physically involved in drawing some control. And by putting them then in this DLL and creating the BCX wrapper class for it, for like the pyramid, for example, then anyone could have a pyramid on their Visual Fox Pro form just by setting a few of those settings that exist on the control itself. And it's my hope that this kind of design will 
allow people to see that there's some benefit in drawing stuff graphically outside of Visual Fox Pro because number one, it's drawn so quickly, and number two, once you get it set up to work, it'll work on anything. Um, you just simply drop it on there, and then you have a Visual Fox Pro class which you're just sending data to and telling it what colors and so forth to use, and it draws it for you more or less the way Visual Fox Pro does with your command buttons and shapes and if you put an image up on the screen and so forth. So this small amount of um, upfront programming to do the work of the DLL to get the interface set up for whatever it is you want to draw and then telling the DLL how to draw it allows all of those features to be exposed from that point forward. So like your example, I'm sure if you, if you write a wrapper for us to, to use it by, like a BFP function a call that that will make the 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 testing easier. You know, we 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 there's um, too complexity in in by calling uh, C functions and and DLLs. So if, right. I'm sure if if you can make a three or or four controls that that. Um, can be defined by simple BFP functions uh, that will will uh, clear the path for us to use it. I understand. Um, I think like this new form I'm creating here, if you can see this, okay. I dropped a real-time DLL um, the label that it's a class on here. That will do the de defining of the functions, and then I drop the other control in here, and I can resize it to whatever size I want the graph to actually be. And apart from adding the show code, which um, on this one I've got some control on the button. Yeah, no Visual Fox Pro. <laughs> um, if I put this kind of like show code over here to actually display this thing, let's see what this code is. This may be all that's required to make that draw. There's code on here for that particular named object. There you see, I mean, just by creating this brand new form, dropping the one class on it, which is this real-time DLL down here, and then dropping the graph on top of that, and then adding the code to actually do the showing, it now renders itself. Show us that show code again. Okay. Um, in this particular one, because of the nature of the other person who used this, they had um, they were using the gradient color on the background. I grabbed points from the screen using Visual Fox Pro's function of whatever the left coordinate is. And the, you know, this is the upper left, upper right, lower right, lower left. It just basically grabs the color of the background form. So when it draws, it draws it in the same color. But this line right here is really the only line that's needed. Um, you have the handle of this thing that it created when it first, when the form was first created, and it's an init event. And then what you do right now is you simply initialize it. Once it's initialized, it knows to start drawing itself. And then what you do is you hide it or you show it, which in the first case here it will show it. So these points, this, these aren't even really needed right there. Mm -hmm. And I got some of, the, some of the values on the graph, the low value, the high value, were just defaults that come in with the control. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So this does, let's see if this does this now like that. And this one graph one. Oh, okay. Deleted a line too many. And I just went for my other object. So. so here it is drawn now with the default white color for the entire background instead of using the samples from the form. And it's got a large margin, which makes it look kind of funny when it's a small control like this. But by decreasing the size of the margin, it would look more normal. Yeah. <laughs> so there's all that stuff. But that's basically it. I can also do the same with the gauge on here. It's a show on it. 
just make this a little bit bigger. I'll actually take the wrap off and just use the same code here for this. I'll just call this one wrap. Yeah, same code should work. One key. So there is the default gauge based on, you know, me just dropping it on there and telling it to draw itself. Now if I want to set a value, let me add a control to this real quick to give it a value. Um, we'll type that in and we'll give a button to say set the needle value. And we'll have this default to um, 15. Let's say set value. Be, let me get the code from here. Set needle value. Expand that graph form should actually gauge. Set needle value. This form that text form that graph. And then we have to have it redraw itself, I think, for this version. So we show it. I'm not sure what the D is there. This should be interesting. Uh -huh. So by clicking on that, it redraws the needle at there, and whatever value I set it to, it will redraw. And what you would do programmatically in your application is just simply call that function with whatever you needed it to do, whatever the value was you needed it to be. And you just simply say, set the needle value to whatever the value is you want it to be. So this DLL, also for color wheel, but the color wheel is much more primitive than what this is, but the DLL does all the drawing and the class exposes it as just more or less a control you drop on your form. Whenever you would have an application for this, you know, I mean, I, I think the gauge idea is interesting for certain things. This was showing the speed at which these things were coming down the conveyor line, how many parts per minute, I believe. And this is a useful tool to have something like that because you can look up at the gauge. You want it to stay in the yellow range. If it's in the red, it's going to go faster than the scales can read or the machines can't, you know, keep their lines filled, whatever. But the graph is also interesting, but those aren't the only controls that can be drawn this way or used this way. The other controls um, that aren't yet written that people would need can be created and in the same way as just dropping onto a form with these two class objects and a little bit of setup code, like on this show button, that's it. It works. This can actually be set up. The re reason I did this was because it had to grab the points in the background. If we take this code and put this on the init event of this control and say this dot if that's right. Control init is not handle. And there it draws by itself. The only reason I had it set up that way before is to draw by the show button was because it had to sample those four points for the, the gradient background fill. Does this all make sense? Yeah, that's nice. Okay. That looks like a lot so of work the... in the DLL though. Who got to pay for that? <laughs> well, yes. Um, it was a lot of work. It, it took me I did actually the first part of this in about eight hours for that guy. But then there were lots of little things I wanted to add. Like I added the, the coloring for the that little white strip I told you about that gives it a little bit of shadowing and stuff. Just things to make it look nicer. Um, I ended up probably with about 40 hours of it all told, but that's just because I kind of go crazy with stuff like that. <laughs> um, 
but in order to draw additional controls, you know, that's a one-time effort. And people who are interested in doing open source software, like um, Caesar or someone like that, they can and um, use fee, I think that's how you pronounce his name. You can go out and do these, get them written, get them tested, get them created, and then they just simply work for everybody else. And that's what my desire is. I wouldn't even mind writing additional controls. I just don't personally happen to know what other controls people would like or be interested in. But in terms of the actual code, I mean, if you look at the very bottom of this, 2,511 lines of source code to draw this. Probably of that, I would say 15 or 1,800 lines, probably 1,800 lines are actual static. They won't change. That's a, an algorithm to draw a line. That's an algorithm to draw a circle, things like that. Those won't need to be changed. So there's only really about 700 lines of code that actually do the work of drawing all of these controls through these interfaces. And to do another one, that's then half of that added on top of it. So you're up to you know 1,100 lines or whatever um, of actual real processing code. And you do another one on top of that, it's up to 1,400 and so forth. It's not a huge thing. And I'm willing to code a lot of it, but I know other people will be able to code it as well. Or at least come up with the ideas of how they want it to look, and then I can do the actual work in C++ if they can do it in some other form. Because the style of the gauge that I have here mimicked the gauge that already exists in the application. Um, he was actually using Fox charts, I think, to draw the content on the screen. But he wasn't able to get it to re-render itself quickly enough. He wanted this to be able to show with the you know, 200 parts per minute coming down the line. Um, be able to show the graph in real time and so forth. He just wasn't able to do it. So that's how this came about. But if there are other people that have other functions, I'd be happy to introduce those capabilities at all or as well. These are I just simply did because that's all that you know was required for the particular task. That's all he asked for, and that's all I needed to do. So. Have you looked at putting it on VFPX? Um, not really. Some. Stuff I have, I downloaded, but I haven't really gone through any of it. This might be a, a spot where more people could find it and know about it for you. Yeah, um, I have no problem with that. I mentioned to Caesar today on Foxite about um, about the Codeplex and the VFPX archive that's there. Um, one of the reasons I've used GitHub for everything has been because I use Git and I found Git to be an absolutely incredible um, source control management tool because it's distributed and because it's just it's amazingly powerful um, and it's extremely fast. So there's some benefits. Plus, everything that I do, like this right now, is a virtual machine, 32-bit Windows 7 that I'm running right now. Everything that I do, I do in Linux, except for stuff that I have to do for work, which is done in Windows because most of it's Fox Pro or Visual Studio. But even the work that I do for Windows typically is done inside of a virtual machine running in Linux. And Git is very, very big in the Linux community and most of the open source communities. So I've gone with that. Um, but I have no problem with putting this anywhere. I mean, it's out there right now, and it's copyleft protected, which means anyone who wants to take the source code and use it in their own application, they're free to do so. The only constraint they have is they have to re-release it to other people with the same license. So I give it to you, full access to source code, full access to use it for whatever you want to. You have to give it to the next person using with the same rights you receive. And um, that's one of the benefits of the copyleft protection is that everybody who gets the software gets those rights no matter how far it goes. So someone else could take this and put it on VFPX right now, for example. What about including it in your for sale applications? That's perfectly fine. That's the fine and left. Cool. All right. The only okay. <laughs> I was just gonna say thanks, Sirk. Sounded like you were done. Thanks, Rick. Yeah. You're welcome. Are there any other questions about any of this? Because I know I went through a lot of it somewhat quickly. Well, it, it, I, I think it's a, a very extensive matter. This. Uh, and and since it's a major a C C language, there's nothing a, a 
that we can ask here uh, just just to read the documentation. Right. Um, one of the things that I did was the forms I put out there for both color wheel and real time, they work just exactly as they are. So if you have any questions about what they do, you know, look at the click events on these controls and look at the timers that are invisible on here that do things. And you'll be able to figure out through the code that's there exactly how to make them work. But in all pra for all practical purposes, these controls are dropped onto another form and they start working. Um, and if you have any questions, like I said, I've got this last page on the PDF file. You know, please contact me. I have, like I said, I spent like 40 hours working on this with this other man, trying to get his system all working the way he wanted it. He's very happy with it, but he wanted a few other things. Um, he wanted me to to scan the <laughs> the gauge. He wants it to be like Chrome. So I'm not sure if, about doing that because Chrome's kind of hard to control. I told him I would do it with a bitmap, but that's a whole separate issue. Um, so I don't have any problem working on things like this from my work on Visual Pre Pro. This is actually quite a, a nice diversion because it's a new project that doesn't go on for a long period of time. Like I said, even with everything I did on both Color Wheel and Real Time, it wasn't much more than 40 hours. Um, Color Wheel I did in about a day, so it was like eight hours. But Real Time took me quite a bit more because I designed it to be so extensible. But um, it wasn't more than a week's worth of work or so. So adding another control now that the bulk of it's there is like an evening's worth of work. If somebody came up and said, you know, can you add a pyramid to this? Just tell me how you want the pyramid drawn, and yes, I can do that, and probably, you know, four or five hours in the evening. So, I I could ask you one question, but related with the 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 communication between uh, a C3 and a BSP process, because uh, in in other project uh, on BSPX. That I currently use and 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 I use in my Interfox server. Uh, chill I don't know if that is the pronunciation. Uh, on the BFP to C32, he has a function called uh, create um, create a, um, um, he can create an, another process on on a C thread, but he doesn't provide a, a, the callback functionality. Once you you get a a, a BFP MT DLL working on the C thread, you cannot communicate with it until it is done. So, if there is no way. Uh, to to get a, a, a BFP MTDLL to communicate the progress of a, of a working thread to the the main of, of the calling process. Um, what you need is a level of indirection. I'll go to this function here and I'll show you what this does. I have a function I created called like render the graph, which is just simple. It creates another thread. And what this thread does is, in the background, it draws this graph. But as soon as it calls this function and tells Windows to create this other thread, it immediately returns back to Visual Fox Pro. So if you have some functionality that exists in the DLL right now, what you need to do is create an intermediary where you call your DLL, which in another thread calls the other DLL. That way you can continue to come right back to Visual Fox Pro and keep running your program while the other DLL in the other thread is busy waiting for the response from whatever this other DLL, the third DLL does. Does that make sense? Yes, yeah, so so technically it, it, it is possible. I I just uh, got another way to do it with, with memory mapped files. I, I, I haven't started working with it yet, but uh, that's the path I, uh, I'm going. Okay. If um, there's the thing about multi-threaded design is this is something that not a lot of people realize in Visual Fox Pro in that world because Visual Fox Pro isn't really multi-threaded. But what you can do is, like, see, I've got this function right here called Thread Busy, um, or this 
setting, whether or not this is busy or not. If it's in the middle of drawing something, it's going to be busy. But as soon as it's done drawing, it lowers this flag and it's not busy. The next time it will go through this code. Um, you may not know what C++ is. So this is the same in Visual Foxtrot if I were to say, if LL thread busy, or actually if not, this thing right here is the same as the not. If not thread busy, you know, do the work, end it. So this code right here in C++ is the same as Visual Foxtrot code like that. So what I'm doing down here is inside of this function, I'm doing work if I'm not already doing work. <laughs> I start the project or the task of redrawing this graph if I'm not already in the process of redrawing the graph. Well, in your example, where you have a function that's being called that could be taking time in the background to complete, you would also have one of these busy flags. But what you would do is rather than just simply ignoring it like I do here, you would queue up the next command so that as soon as this thread gets completed, it would send the next command to that background thing. And then you'd have another function which allows you to determine the load, like there's you know five commands waiting to be sent to this other DLL. Or if it's if it's clear, if there's you know the everything's been processed through and so forth. But with yeah. having the with having the multi threaded design like that, you can queue things up to run kind of like in the background by themselves and they do their job however you set them up to do it, but the rest of the program is free to continue on doing all of its work. Yeah, I, I know. I, I use the create three object function uh, from the BFPX uh, FP2 C32. That's Bonzi. It, it has no no callback function from the uh, running thread. You have to wait for the the background process to end to to the to to return to the main process to get the, the information back. So you cannot um, know, you cannot know uh, how long will it, will it take or, or to get uh, the information about uh, how much of the job is done in the background. That's a feature of this particular thread function in BFPX? Yeah, uh, you you can uh, look at it. it. It's called create thread object. Okay. Well, that's not a limitation of the system because what you can do is you can spawn this process in the other thread and let it continue on its own, and then you pass the H wind of your application you're running the form. And use bind event so that when that one gets done, it can send you a message saying, "I have now completed my task." But in the meantime, your program doesn't have to wait; it can keep going. And I don't know if that's a limitation of that particular library, but that's not a limitation of the technology. That's just an implementation that ha may have that limitation in it. Well, that's good to know. Do um, if I load this window over the top, can you see that part of the window I've just brought up there? I just see the call to render the graph code. Okay, you don't see the notepad plus plus window I'm dragging over the top of that window? No. Let me try and bring something up here real quick. Um, let's switch window two. That's interesting that that does that that way. Can you see this Visual Fox Pro window now? Yeah, that we can see. Okay. I've been working on this process here that does remote procedure calls. And what this is designed to do is it's the same basic thing as what the DLL was I showed you over there. It has a definition. You have an incoming and an outgoing class. The outgoing class allows you to do things like you can spawn a thread or launch a process. And one of the functionalities of this is um, whether or not it's supposed to be um, synchronous, where it waits for it to get finished before it continues on. 
I also have the ability then from the other launch process to send it a command that it executes and also return a value. You get x equals some command you're executing. So this capability exists inside of, you know, Windows allows for this, Visual Fox Pro allows for this. It's just a matter of how it's actually designed into the library itself. But you can spawn external processes. One of the things you see here when you create this or spawn the connection is you have a, an HWIN that it's bound to. And this goes back to your actual form. Now let me bring this up real quick. And what it will do is it will send a message back to this form on its HWIN value saying that I have now completed something. And in this particular example, it just simply launches a copy of itself. You can give it a command to execute, and it will also give it a command and return the result and so forth. And it does all of this you know, using common features of Windows. It's name pipes and message windows and so forth. But there's no lack of limitation or no um, lack of ability inside of Visual Fox Pro or inside of Windows or inside of the DLLs that would prevent it from continuing on while that other background process does its thing. Hi. Uh, are you there, Rick? Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, Ray? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, I, I can hear you. Uh, well, uh, it, it's great. Uh, I think uh, this is an extensive uh, subject, but yes. the the basic uh, um, functionality has been um, covered on your presentation. The um, the basic gist of what I wanted to convey on this is that there are no limitations. Um, let me see if I have a comment in here about this. Some place in here where I have a comment like that, unless I've edited it out, I can't remember. It was my hope. Um, the fact that these capabilities exist, and they're not, you know, I, I've been doing this type of programming for a long time, and I have not seen this kind of um, interface done very often. It's not something that's common, at least. But what real time does is it exposes that relationship between Visual Fox Pro and the class to the background heavy lifting that's done in the DLL. And with remote procedures and all these other things that could be added, there's no limit to what could be done and what could be made possible for these applications. The only question becomes is, you know, how much time do people want to put into Visual Fox Pro anymore because it's end of life and there's no real reason to um, continue developing it when people want to move to .NET or other platforms. So there's questions like that. But it, it's been my hope with producing this and releasing the source code and giving this little talk about it that other developers will see um, the design in this template about how you have that interface and you can extend it to do all these different things and then will contact me to help them run with it or um, you know, just more or less people will come together and the ideas and the things they need in their application, um, I might have some skills that allow that to happen or I might have some ideas that allow other people's skills to make that happen. But by all of us coming together, we can produce something much more than what we have right now that will be a benefit for all people who use uh, Visual Possible Program. So that's You're right. Go ahead. I didn't hear what you said. No, I, I think you're, you're, you're right. This is a, 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 the, the community can do the, the extensions, the, the platform needs. Uh, I don't know if, if someone, if, if anybody has uh, well, more questions. I'm done. Okay. Well, I thank you for listening. I thank you for you know, going through this presentation. This is now an hour and 20 minutes or so. But um, if anyone has any questions or would like to contact me about some specific requirements or some of the possibilities, uh, I'll be happy to answer all those questions and 
if there's another one of these that's needed, and maybe not through the online, you know, the OFUG, it could be through something else. But I'll be happy to sit down and explain this in greater detail because there are there is a lot involved in the mechanics of making it happen. But in terms of understanding what needs to happen, it's not that difficult. Um, but to get it to work like inside of the C++ DLL, that's somewhat complex. But in order to understand what's happening, that's something you could explain to someone in you know 20 minutes. So I'll be happy to go through it any level of detail that people would like. Cool. Thanks, Rick, for presenting. Thank you for letting me present. <laughs> we will move on to uh, show us your apps. Matthew, you All ready right. to go? Well, I uh, don't know. Uh, I'm ready. I'm ready as well, if I can find the mute fast enough. <laughs> we'll see. All right, I'll turn it over to uh, Matthew, who's going to show us some zip code stuff. Well, go ahead. We're waiting. Hopefully, you guys are seeing my screen right now. Uh, yep, Student Manager 7.2. Okay. Uh, first of all, a little bit about me. I'm Matthew. I work for Aceware Systems, and we do registration software for continuing education places. So it's a non-credit registration is what, what we do. Uh, uh, deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, kind of the the driving force behind uh, the different features in this is customer requests or different customers of ours request different things, and we try to try to make it um, usable for everybody. So if somebody came to my boss and asked if if we could filter a report to only show people in a certain radius, like they were looking to mail out a pamphlet or, or some sort of marketing uh, material um, only to a certain range around, um, well, in this case, it was a particular uh, a building that they were that they were wanting to uh, run this class in. And some of our customers, like um, well, one of the examples that comes readily to mind is we've got a place in South Carolina. They have actually three campuses, but they also have off-campus places that they will house some of their um, classes in, you know, kind of a community outreach type stuff. Um, um, you know, sometimes using community buildings to run classes in and things like that. But anyway, they, uh, in, in their case, if they're running a particular class at just one campus, uh, they would want to send a mailing out only in that the, the range of that campus. And so that's where where the idea of this began. So I built into the report, our report structure, uh, right, and it can go in any of these uh, report areas that we have in our app, but I, I'm going through mailing labels because that's where we set up a mailing. Uh, this screen doesn't really matter. I'm just going to leave everything default here. But for, for the purposes of this example, I'm going to just query, to begin with anyway, query the entire database. Uh, I don't have that many in my database, so it's uh, not too bad for me to do that. Uh, so when I select a report, I'm actually going to select one that where I've got some default in, uh, defined already. What it's doing here is uh, in running the report, I've got it to where it's pulling up what, what's been called the geospatial selector here. So I can define you know, what zip code is my bullseye 
how far out some of the radius from that bullseye, how far out do I want to grab people to kind of, it's, at this point we're sub-querying for the report. I'm going to go ahead and leave it uh, since our business is out of Manhattan, Kansas. Just uh, leave it Manhattan, Kansas and show um, just people 100 miles away. Um, so hit continue here. It's doing the subquerying, bringing up the report. So it's not, and probably too small to see, but it's not our 70 some people. I think it said 72. 72 people down to just 25 people. So these are all the people. You got one Nebraska place that happened to be within the 100 miles. Uh, everything else is hitting Kansas. Um, so is it, this all it, done by zip code, or is this using the address also? Yes, I was just getting to that. The, it, it's only by zip code. I found a CSV file that mat, that uh, gave la longitude and latitude for the zip codes. So it takes um, the 66502 zip code, uh, obviously 66501 is right next by, but uh, um, oh, Fort Riley is just right next to Manhattan as well. I think there's some Topeka addresses, but yeah, some Topeka. Um, you know, those, that's just, uh, I think about 50 miles down the road or so. Uh, so just grab to those. Um, you could, I guess it could be extended if you did get some service to give you exact longitude and latitude of the addresses. I thought for our purposes, getting just the zip code is, is good enough. Um, now, obviously, if you want to drill down to like within five miles of your campus, that yeah, that you would need specific um, coordinates for your addresses. But uh, usually, our or from what what we were when we pulled our customer base, uh, they would be looking um, 25 miles up to 50 miles, really. Uh, try to pull pull people in kind of that range. Um, there, uh, is everybody hearing me okay? I just saw a question pop up about the voice. Uh, yeah, I'm hearing oh, you just Rick. fine. There. Yeah, Rick just says he hears me. So. Okay. Um, so, yeah, we, we didn't want to, or we didn't go into the specific quality of, of an address per se. And what I'm doing, and I, I posted this code earlier today on the forum, uh, or, well, not the forum, our message board, really, um, that I'm using the Haversign formula to, to actually figure out the distance in miles. And this is distance as the crow flies, not as you drive. This is, um, uh, yeah. So that's one one thing you need to keep in mind. So you might be pulling up to 50 miles away, but it may be depending on roads. They could be driving 75 miles. So you might keep that in mind as well. Um, w anyway, with this formula, um, just doing some some really just math and some trig here to, to get our result. Uh, the main thing here, uh, at the end I convert it to miles. So if you don't, if you do want just kilometers, uh, you don't divide it by 1.6, blah, blah, blah. And it just, it'll give, it'll, it'll give the result in kilometers. So um, it can be extended in that way. Uh, if you want to do that for your purposes. Um, any questions about this part? Where did you say you got your, your table of zip codes from? I think I just Googled it. Um, 
this code longitude latitude or something like that. Yeah, it's probably flooding out there, isn't it? Uh, we've yeah, been there was several other problems, but yeah. I could certainly copy it and send it to somebody if they wanna want a copy. Yeah, we've been paying Melissa data. It's a I think it's a few hundred bucks a year, but at least you get an update every quarter. So all, any new zip code comes out, then it, quarterly you get the new table to keep up to date. But it, oh. it is a little bit of money. Uh, it's also got other stuff in it. It's got all the alternate town names and all of that stuff. But oh, yeah, uh, I don't have that much detail. Actually, I've got one one zip code table. Uh, to pull in town names and stuff like that, and that's our, our older uh, model and pulls in town and state and county, all that good stuff. Um, when we went to doing or went to looking at doing this, uh, we just decided since that table didn't have longitude and latitude, we didn't want to uh, uh, alter table on the fly. We just decided to create a second table with this stuff and be able to pass that to our customers instead. Uh, just, just, just kind of for deployment purposes, that was that was easier for us. But uh, we could have certainly uh, added that in to our other zip code tables. But uh, uh, anyway, that's the the filter portion. The next kind of step to this uh, was we were asked to be able to see this on a map. So I'm going to go ahead and close out of the report. And we've got all sorts of address information. Since, you know, we keep track of, track of instructors. Sometimes there's firms sponsoring students, so we keep track of that. Um, students is just in our name table. So for this, since, you know, I'm just showing student locations, uh, I want to show students. So, uh, so when it first pulls up this mapping stuff, and this is, uh, I saw Rick Schumer present this at uh, Southwest Fox last year. He actually, it was in his um, um, how Craig, is it Craig Boyd? How Craig Boyd makes me look awesome, or something like that. Title, yeah, some, the title of it was something like that. But uh, so it was borrowed code when he presented it. So I borrowed this again. Uh, the one thing I couldn't figure out how to do with the map was to display the map and then automatically start editing push pins. And his code just had a go button to do that. So I go ahead and have a uh, the go button as well. I don't know if your screen refreshed fast enough, but there was actually a push pin it put out in Germany. Uh, for some reason, it Bing, this is pulling in Bing Maps uh, through IE. So it, it seems to be that whenever it can't find an address, and of course in my demo I've got fake addresses all over the place, uh, if it can't find an address, it picks a spot in Europe, usually in Germany, and just puts it there. But uh, anyway, it, uh, I need to figure out who that person is so I can fix the address. But anyway, you get kind of get the idea here. I'm zooming out a little bit to, to show my 100-mile my radius from Manhattan, Kansas, and hover over the different push pins. And so now I can visualize where my customers are coming from. You can barely see it, but there's two people here from Topeka. Another um, caveat with this mapping, if there's more than one person at the same address, you only see one push pin. So I've got a bunch of people in my demo database at the headquarters uh, on 7480 Dyer Road, but yet I can only see Tom Smith. So that kind of, yeah, some of our customers complain about that. But uh, anyway. Rick was asking uh, if those push pins are from, those are the 25 addresses you found before? Yes. Okay. 
that got filtered down. Yeah, because I haven't run a separate report. I'm just showing this all in, in one thing. That way we don't have to run multiple things. Um, so yeah, these are the 25 that got that fit inside of my 100 mile radius. And I can't, I don't. I kind of wish I could see that 25 mile radius, but uh, you kind of get the idea. Some way to draw a circle um, on there would be nice. Yeah. Maybe Rick will yeah, do that for us. Get, <laughs> get Rick to do a graph on top. Or, I, or I, actually, there's, there's a lot of stuff you could do for automation on this. Um, that's one of the other features that exists in Windows. You can send it fake mouse moves and face key, fake keystrokes. And on a fixed form like this, where you know where the things are, that would not be too hard to do. Ah, yeah. Get it on there. I seem to remember that there was some drawback to using Bing to do this from Rick's presentation. Like it was expensive or you can't use it in a commercial app or is that ringing a bell um, for you? No. The only things I remember was the uh, um, showing addresses that weren't found in, in Germany and then the, um, uh, well, you saw it at the end at Zoom last push pin instead of kind of showing you in the general area where the push pins were. Um, it is, this is, it's kind of bloatware. It's made my, the made the program bigger uh, just by adding this stuff into it. Um, that's kind of the, the biggest drawback I've seen. But uh, no, I haven't, I haven't ran into any licensing restrictions considering, you know, the bottom right hand corner it's got um, um, different, uh, you know, the different uh, copyright. So, yeah. Hmm. Yeah, maybe I'm remembering something uh, else. Yeah. If anybody else remembers, let me know because that would be, I would hate to be breaking copyright law. <laughs> uh, but the only other thing I was going to say about this, uh, one of the uses, uh, still using that example, campus down in South Carolina that has the, or not the campus, they have three campuses, the, the school does. So they could see, like if they're only running a course in one uh, campus and they're wanting to see, you know, on a map where those people are coming from, and then they notice that a lot of the people are coming from a near a different campus. Um, then they could either consider moving the course to that campus or running a second version of that course at that second campus. So kind of, well, there are schools that their theory is bring the schools to the students rather than have the students have to come to the school. So that uh, they want to be in the, the different communities and provide those services to those communities. So this is a great tool for them uh, to, to see where those students really are and where they're coming from. But I'm sure everybody else can figure out other examples to fit their own customer base and use it for them. Yeah. Cool. Thanks, Matthew. Uh huh. Any questions? Well, if anybody thinks of anything, certainly email me through the the group page or or find me on Twitter or whatever. So, thank you. I guys. do have one real quick. Um, how big? Sure. How much bigger was the application? I mean, was it like ten megabytes or was it a few megabytes oh, or what? Not ten. I would say two or three meg. Okay. Okay. I think I saw somebody say run it through a separate app, and I'm almost to the point of yeah, I I kind of wish I'd made this as a separate app to run on top. Uh, but yeah. Hindsight's fifty or hindsight's twenty twenty. So. <laughs> All right, so we had uh, one more show us your app for tonight. Marco was going to give us a quick look at a couple different functions, right? Yes, I am here. All right, I will make Marco the presenter. Hey. 
Uh, it's downloading. Uh, feel free to close this web page. Okay. Switch screen, select window. Uh, don't know if you see anything yet. Yep, we're seeing a Fox Pro window. We're seeing only about half of the command window, though. Bot nope, there we go. Now we can see the whole desktop. Looks good. How do we limit the screen to the Fox Pro window? Oh, let's, let's leave it that way. Okay. Well, I'm going to show you uh, three apps I'm developing. It's, uh, it's apart from the Interfax project. Uh, it's a, a, a web server. It's like the EVA web server. You know about that project? Have you heard about it? About it? Mm, I have not, no. Well, let's start. Uh, first, uh, you can um, have what you're seeing now is a multi uh, full web server that is running in um, in a window. It can be wrong in the background too. So if you point to this uh, address, you're going to show you're going to see this, this page was served by Visual Fox Pro. You know? Can, can you see the screen? Yeah, we can see the browser. Okay. Feel free to type this address on your, on your web browser. Okay. That's too small for me to see. Maybe somebody else can see it. Let me... Can you unhighlight it? Oh, let's paste it. Oh, okay, yeah. We can get... The link is in the chat <laughs> window. Just as I get it typed in. Okay, that's <laughs> me coming through right there. Awesome. Can you see the, the connections on the left pane? Yeah, as it's feeding content. Okay, this page has been served by my web browser. Web server, excuse me. Excuse my English. It's the first time I, I made a, a presentation in English. So, this web, uh, web server allows me to, to not only deliver a static content, it allows me to uh, get a scripted pages like the active BFP or, or web connection. It's all uh, running in, on BFP. Let's see. I'm going to show you. Uh, let's bring Firebug. It supports compression, supports uh, catching, when I do the refresh here, you say Firebug here. Uh, let's see. I don't know if, if it's something related with the join me. Okay. Here we are. Do you see the screen? Yes. Okay. Here you have the response times, and you see this. This supports the the web uh, catching, supports um, um, Here you can see that this page was served by Interfox uh, 1.0. Last modified, this is the, the date of the, this file. 
the Fox uh, Web Data Service. If I, uh, excuse me, I have two monitors. This is the, the folder that, that is, is shared from, from the internet, right? Here I, I have some tests. You can uh, try this link. Let's, let's put this address. This one's not found. One minute. Okay. Here, I I, I just made a simple um, a script on BSP, right? This um, selects the top two records from the employees uh, not within database and convert it to a JSON stream. Then it just simply put it back to to the to the web client. Are you there? Yes. Okay. Well. Here you can see that the JSON response, um, I choose the JSON response with formatted content. And the cursor has been converted in a, a simple array, right? If I choose the, to, I'm going to change, make some uh, simple change to the script here. and. These two parameters. If I if I don't don't put the these parameters, let's let's save the script and reload it. Okay. Save it. Okay. Now the JSON response is not formatted, right? You see uh, this function. You can try this address. Copy. Let's give it to you. Okay. Try try that link. Did Got you have it. the response? Yes, same as yours. Okay. <clears throat> you know that, uh, you can see, uh, uh, yeah, wait, uh, I can, okay, okay. The JSON response is not, is not formatted, okay? If I just put this second parameter, I can choose the JSON cursor to be converted to uh, an array of objects instead of a simple array. I, uh, here, you can see that this is an object. Address, birth date, city, country, employee ID. But when you have a, um, um, a great amount of data, I choose not to convert this to two objects because it, it's slower when you are um, converting back to a cursor. So if I can pass this second um, parameter and I set it to true, let's save it, try again, you see that now I have the output in a, in a copy to array in a simple select into array, and the array is converted to a JSON a, a string. I can choose to, with the third parameter, 
to have the output formatted for presentation. You can test it. Very cool. Okay. So, uh, the object has, uh, um, the JSON object has two objects, the rows and the structure. This structure is a simple uh, fields converted to JSON. This, this, um, this, uh, these functions um, Let's see. Okay. Yeah. Wait. I'm gonna stop the the server. Oh no. Let, let's leave it that way and open up another Fox Pro screen. I have here. Um. Sample, samples that that I I have gathered from the internet, and then in, and casually I found one you sent to Rick Stral. You have uh, some trouble when you were dealing with rich text. Um, dot. Yeah, I did. Yeah, I, I took the liberty to to to. Um, to test it with my routine, and I must have a key here. You send him this this little snippet, and I I thank you because I I made some adjustment that um, that the program needed. So. That, no, I'll just give him the background here. There in the West Wind connection, which I use. There's a Rick has a JSON serializer as well, but it didn't didn't work so well with my table that had a bunch of rich text in it. Well, uh, I got it. Let's let's run it. Yeah, you got a different one. Yeah, record count one uh, in Spanish uh, equal iguales. Here here you have the your your the serialized uh, row and the um, the object and this is with so, your json serializer yes right okay this is the the name of the of the resulting table for example you only need to give this line set procedure to MT, mte json and you can have a you can create a JSON object on the fly. That's something that Rick uh, explained it, that uh, the, the .NET uh, serializer has. I made my own implementation uh, on BFP uh, using the access, this access functions. So you can do something like this. Let's, uh, but let's, let's review some Some examples. Let's close uh, this. These are examples uh, gathered from the internet. Okay. Here, uh, this um, these are some JSON examples. For example, um, a very complex one. These are um, uh, information returned by Twitter. So you can consume uh, a web service with, with confidence. So, so um, I, have found, I haven't found uh, any uh, JSON string that can be converted properly. For example, uh, for those that are not uh, familiar with the JSON, let's see the the object converted on real time. For the 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 debugger can show us. Okay. 
Okay. Let's see. For example, um, if you have, um, let's see, if tropical index, you have products, no storms region, no the map um, advisory number category. It's a, it's a very complex uh, JSON object, but here you can see that you can navigate through it with ease. So you can see the uh, JSON string converted to an object, um, a BFP object. Let's let's do one one. Um, One test here. I can copy any internet um, content and let's read it on the clip uh, clipboard. There you have it. Here is the JSON represented. That's right. If you have any questions. Cool. Okay. One one benefit of this uh, new routine is the speed. Okay. Uh, and rely and and this is more reliable. You you won't believe, but uh, I found in my test that uh, this is. Um, up to four times faster than Craig Boyd routine that is based on C on a CFLL. Uh, I I can benchmark against other um, 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 JSON serializer because I have no access to to other. No, no, uh, having time to do it. Okay, but. For example, you can uh, do, let's see, another um, thing that I want to show you is the pivot control, okay? The pivot control allows you to get the uh, an Excel functionality like for making complex um, um, it, it, it tables based on on dynamic um, queries. Here, for example, I can uh, I, I can start. I'm going to show you five or six uh, uh, examples based on the orders table. Okay, we can do. This is the Nordwing database. We can do a simple uh, table for 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 start. Let's say we want to know the quantity by the number of orders by by ship country. Okay, this is a simple uh, query, but if you want it to to be to show this by city, I can simply add another parameter. Okay. Are you following me? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Let's say we want to know 
the that the the the, the cities on the on the uh, on or the the ship. Let's see the fields we have at our disposition. I want to know the shipments made by a month. Okay, I can do a distribution. Okay, let's see, ship date, uh, ship a date, excuse me. Can you see? Yeah. Okay, L uh, this can be easily uh, exchanged. Let's, let's uh, copy. Did we lose people? Anybody else still on? No, I'm not hearing you, Rick. That's weird that I'm the only one. Hmm. Now we get Marco Sack, he'll be back. I got the feeling he wasn't dialing in from anywhere close by. Can you hear me now? Yep. Now I got you. Okay. I just disconnected and reconnected. Weird. Hmm. I think these things are, are fantastic. I think we should do them about once a week. <laughs> <laughs> you you organize the off weeks. <laughs> is it a fee thing or is it just a something you do? Um, it's just something I've done just to get it started. We just started this in uh, what was our first one? November. Yeah. So the join the join me is twenty bucks a month is all, which I've been footing so far. But it uh, is. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes. Hey Marco. Welcome back. Okay. Uh, where were we? Here we are. Let me close this. Okay. So uh, let's clone this. This. I can exchange like we do in, in Excel. Now the ship country and ship city will be shown as the column distribution and the rows will show the month. Can you see? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. That's pretty slick. Okay. It is slick. Do you uh, turn this loose to your customers to use? No, no. This is a work in progress. In okay. fact, okay. In fact, I I think this can be very useful to to show everyone. Uh, huh? I think it can be useful to everyone. <laughs> yeah. Uh, let's. Uh, you're not. Uh, wait to see. I can. I can uh, have as many as aggregate fields as I want. I can have, for example. Uh, zoom, fake, and then I can have orders, fake, order by month. So, but you know that I I need to to put a zero here to get the month shipped uh, on the right. Uh, Place. So, 
this can be expressions too so I can use uh, trans any any Fox Pro expression that is allowed into a select statement can be used here. Uh, I don't remember if it's L. Okay. So uh, let's see if you want the distribution not only by month but by day. I'm impressed you know that syntax off the top of your head. I'd have to look that one up. Um, thank you. Okay. Don't recognize it. Let's say transform day, ship it day. As this month. Let me see. Okay. I can have the month and the day. <laughs> so I can filter cool. the source data or the results. For example, if I if I just wanted to get the the shipment that has the that has been um, let's say has been let's say let's say let's say that that we just want to zoom or or get on the results the shipments that had uh, a freight under uh, $10. Okay, I can use but let's uh, do um, a, a, a distribution by let's clone this Okay, yeah, let's see. Let me see some some uh, other examples that I, I have uh, so so we can not waste time here. For example, I have here I I want to know the 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 sum of of freight as total freight by country, by city, and by employee distributed by um, ship beer for taking only those uh, shipments that has a uh, freight uh, less uh, or equal to 15. Here you are. So this is ship beer that that is just one, two, or three. Okay. The total freight and the employee that sent those uh, shipments. Okay. I can have a, a complex. Um, this this can have. A, let me if if i wanted just the 
results that contains the employee number three. Okay. ID, you wanted employee ID. Employee ID, let, let, let's see. Uh, okay. Employee ID. No, let me see. not working well. Let's, let me see another test example. Let me see. For example, I, I here choose a distribution. I can have uh, the, the number of orders, the total freight, the ship country, ship city, and in my distribution by columns, I take the uh, um, a distribution getting ranges, ranges uh, uh, from 15. So this complex um, uh, query is, is solved easily. For example, 0 to 50, 50 to 100, 100 to 150, and the results uh, or the source, for example, if I if I choose to filter the source data, and I want it to to take in count only uh, those shipments that um, that were less than uh, 15, it's freight. Yes. There you go. That's and the results can be uh, filtered. So this is the having condition of the query. So uh, um, if I wanted just only the rows that, or the that, that, that meet certain criteria, I can see From cities that starts uh, from C. Okay, uh, uh, I might have changed something there, but as every one of us know, it was working. Okay, um, I have here, for example ship country, ship city as the rows, and ship via as, as, as the column distribution, taking in account only those freight, uh, this has been on, let's see. Okay. There I have only results that, that are greater than 500. I don't know if you wanted to 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 add something. Well, I guess that's really cool and really powerful. I'm trying to imagine how I'd use it. I can't. I can't see handing that to any of my clients and have them understand that in the least, how to use it. Well, 
Uh, this is something like uh, this control. I, I plan to implement this like like this. Con uh, I seen this Telerik control. Okay, they have this. You can drag the the fields and information is is um, um, instantly presented the way the client wants. This can be useful to to make graph data data because the information can be exported to Excel or um, reports, etc. So uh, here I can easily print it or get a preview. Okay. If, uh, this has all the power of the CSS. Uh, I choose HTML uh, over the um, the FlexGrid control because this is more powerful, of course. And and I'm towards uh, getting all my development to 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 online access. Mm -hmm. So, for example, uh, here we can see. Uh, let's look another. Okay. Are you wanting to write that control where you drag and drop stuff? That that's just part of the implementation. Okay. Uh, in fact, I could just uh, get this this JavaScript because this is a, a client client uh, client side code. Uh, this can be uh, um, um, get get uh, easily from the internet. Right, you okay. can see the code and everything. So, yeah, yeah, that, that, that's just uh, a thing of, of 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 the wrapper, but the the hard work is done. So. Uh, I I I have never seen this kind of control uh, in in any forum. Everybody points to Excel or automating Excel uh, when this can be uh, achieved with this uh, routine. You won't believe, but this only it's it's only 6K. Okay, a 6K program uh, of the size. Of the of the um, the program, you can see this is all it has. Eight eight K. So it's a lightweight function. It can be called as a function. It, it's no uh, it's not an object. So uh, I can, for example, write a program. This were the first test. For example, uh, I have this query. Okay, I can have all the details, product, product name, category name, and I just do this. Uh, I, I write uh, the first um, program. So this is called as a function. Okay, if I run it, I will have. And the result uh, shown on my screen. This is a simple uh, distribution of sales by category, product name, quantity, total orders by quarter, by year. If anybody has a question. No questions? If if we don't have any questions, we're over the two hour mark this month. I think we will call it a night. So well, thank you, Marco. Thanks, Marco. That was really neat. That is very neat. Uh, I I'll be posting maybe this entire project uh, by one or two months on a page called Interfox. Don't know if if it will be available as a, a whole project or a, or a whole um, suite, or 
but uh, the JSON parser will be available as open source. Okay. Um, don't know if this control will be set as a, a BF, BFX project or, or individual, but you can count. You will see it later. Cool. Thanks. Well, Excellent. thank you, Todd. Uh, glad to meet you all. You too. Thanks, Marco. Thanks, Rick. Thank you. Thanks, viewer 22, Bye. whoever you may be. <laughs> okay. We'll see everybody next month. Thank you, well, Todd. Uh,